Um, hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Andrew Hines. Uh, please just call me Andrew. Um, and I'm going to be uh, leading this taster session today on um, why world philosophies and what it might look like to do a BA in world philosophies at SOAS. Um, I want to start by asking you a question. And so if you could just pop it in the chat box, one word. And what that one word I want you to do is I want you to put one word in the chat box that you associate with the word wisdom. I'm just curious what your thoughts are when you hear that word. So if anyone could just write, write a word in the chat box with the word wisdom. So you might think of, I see somebody says knowledge. Okay. Anyone else? Experience, contemplation. Experience, knowledge, reflection. Nice. Okay, love of, interesting. Insight. These are, these are all really good things. Thanks, everyone. I think the um, most students, when they study um, philosophy, they will hear the word wisdom because philosophy actually means lover of wisdom. It comes from the Greek um, and the word um, philo and Sophia together, they combine to mean love of wisdom. So it's something most people learn. I'm gonna tell you a quick story that relates to this word. And then I'm gonna tell you another story that you may not be as familiar with. So most students when they study philosophy will hear this story. There's this guy, Socrates. He's one of the most famous philosophers in um, ancient Greece. So thousands of years ago. And he hears that um, someone has said, Socrates, I heard you're the wisest man of all. And Socrates says, I, am I? I don't think I'm particularly wise. I don't know very much. He's confused by this. And he, he thinks there must be some error. There must be some mistake. So he decides to go about and start asking people questions. And he goes to people that he thinks are particularly knowledgeable or wise men. Um, he goes around and he says, okay, so I know that you know a lot about um, construction. I know that you know a lot about politics. I know that you know a lot about medicine. I know that you know a lot about poetry. Tell me about those things and they give them they give very good answers they give answers that sound very you know sophisticated and polished and they are very knowledgeable and socrates kind of gathers all this information and he's learning things that he doesn't know and he comes to the conclusion finally he comes back to his friend and he says you know i think i am actually the wisest but it's not because i know things it's because everybody i asked thought that they were really wise because they knew loads about one thing, a lot about poetry, a lot about politics, a lot about construction, a lot about medicine. But actually I realized that, but they thought they were wise and they knew everything, but I realized that I didn't know everything. And the inside of the story, the kind of lesson that you usually learn when you study philosophy is that it's really important to continue questioning and continue learning because real wisdom doesn't just come from knowledge, which is important, but it also comes from recognizing that you don't know everything and you always need to learn more. You always need to question more. And that's a really important skill in philosophy and in university. But there's another part of this story that you might not learn or that students might not learn when they study philosophy. And that's this idea of a philosopher being wise and needing to continue question everything actually is written down even earlier, thousands and thousands of years before in ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. And they define the first definition in history of a philosopher as someone who is wise and who asks questions um, and continues to learn, Does, isn't just satisfied with the knowledge they have, but is, continues to ask questions and continues to learn about things. And they define that as a philosopher and they define it as someone who's wise. And so this idea in ancient Egypt becomes really prominent in North Africa. And the Greeks would go to study in North Africa. So there's actually a way that the ideas traveled up. So by the time that story I told you at the beginning, which is a great story about Socrates, a lot of times people don't know that actually that, that idea about being wise is what makes you a philosopher connects back to ancient Egypt and to North Africa. And that's kind of an example of why world philosophies, because it puts ideas in a wider and very global context. 
So now I want to ask you another question. I want to ask you what you think of when you hear the word philosophy. So maybe just, again, one word in the chat box. What's some associations you might have with it? Culture, art, culture and art, thoughtfulness, academia, thoughts and ideas, theory, okay, debate. There's lots of different definitions here. This is really interesting. Questioning, okay, debate, everything, somebody said. Beliefs, fantastic. Big questions, okay. Thanks, everyone. Um, all, all of these things are, are definitely related to, to philosophy. Um, when we study world philosophies, we might be studying how people come about the beliefs they have by asking, asking different questions. We, you do study um, how to debate and build better arguments. Um, one of the key things that I often tell my first year students in philosophy is fundamentally that you'll learn a lot of information, but you won't necessarily answer all the questions you have in philosophy. Philosophy is more about the skill of asking questions. And so uh, some people I've seen have put culture, art, you will think about all these things and will ask questions about these things, but it's more about the skill of asking questions about art and culture. And so usually philosophy is kind of associated with the big questions of life, like what is truth? Is there a God? How should I live? Um, these types of questions are what we might popularly associate with philosophy. And when we study world philosophies, we'll be asking those types of questions and we'll be looking at them from the perspective of multiple cultures around the globe. And we'll be looking at how those different cultures interact and how their ideas might interact. So, um, let me give you another quick example. If you think about um, going back to, we talked about ancient Greece a moment ago. So another quick example is after Socrates, a few hundred years later, another guy comes along named Aristotle. Um, and Aristotle writes a book all about um, the world around us, the natural world. And it becomes the most you know, everybody looks to it as a great source of wisdom in the ancient Mediterranean. And it spreads not just um, in Greece and then in Rome, but it spreads over to, over to parts of Africa, over to what we would today call the Middle East. And it becomes a really important text um, in the Abbasid dynasty and in um, the Islamic golden age. And Aristotle becomes the most prominent um, kind of foundation for philosophy in that period. However, the first time China ever hears the name Aristotle, China had already an entire system of philosophy based on the philosopher Confucius. And when they hear Aristotle, it's hundreds and hundreds of years later, and they look at Aristotle's writings, they're interested in them, and they, but they said, but, but they had a very different system based on Confucius. And these are also some of the questions that we might study in world philosophies, is how different philosophers become important in different cultures and that way the questions people might ask become different in those cultures. So that's another example of why world philosophies and the types of questions we might ask. So I'm just going to now put up on the slide a few different points about the types of things we might study in world philosophies. So philosophy is the first point there, it's a global discipline. So we, we really think it so as it should reflect the intellectual traditions of the whole world as much as possible. And there's a real emphasis on dialogue, like I was saying a moment ago, between different philosophical traditions. So for example, I teach a class um, on metaphysics and I'll talk about what that means in a second. Um, and every week we look at one philosopher from say ancient Greece on what metaphysics means. And then we look at a philosopher from ancient India on what metaphysics means. We look at a dialogue and we try to find areas of commonality, areas of difference, and how those strengthen and can talk to each other's positions. Um, we also think at SOAS, there's an importance of understanding philosophical traditions comparatively, but also in their own terms. So we might ask, in the case of that story I told you about Confucius and Aristotle, why is it 
that um, what does it mean to have a philosophy based on Confucius and not this guy, Aristotle? What's the difference? And, and we think about that in its own terms, not only in relation to Western philosophy. And the other thing that we do is a really rigorous training in the main branches of philosophy. And so I'm, those, I'm gonna read you, they're on the screen there. But the main branches of philosophy that we teach at SOAS is logic, ethics, metaphysics, which I mentioned a moment ago, epistemology, hermeneutics, and ontology. That's a mouthful. So I want to I want to think really quickly about um, a few of those words and what they mean. So again, just in the chat box, what do you think of when you hear the word logic? One word that might come to mind. Reason, using reasoning, okay. System, sense, good. Yeah. Rational thinking, good, yeah. Mathematics, comprehension. These are all different types of things um, that do relate to logic. And, and it, so as we'll study logic as um, we are, it's, it's, we're thinking about the rules that govern rational thinking. And so when you're in your first year, you'll take a course on that. Um, the, the second thing is ethics. What do you think of when you think of ethics? Just pop it in the chat. Morals, morality. Yeah, right and wrong. Culture again. Good. Good and evil politics dilemmas, ethical dilemmas. Yeah. Um, so ethics usually means the study of how should we live. It is closely related to morality. It's the question of how should we live, but also not just us personally, but how should how should the society make the decisions it makes. Um, what should be um, a law and what shouldn't be a law? The, the types of things that govern our, our behaviors and the choices we make, that's ethics. Okay, now there's, now there's the big one that might be confusing. What's metaphysics? What do you think of when you hear that? Abstract ideas beyond the world, other worlds. It's interesting um, that some of you are saying other worlds are beyond the world. Could you, if you feel comfortable, could you just pop in the chat what you mean by that? Why do you think it's beyond other worlds? Not in the physical realm, it can't be explained empirically. Okay, I like that. Somebody else has said, um, something could be possible in other worlds, but not possible in this world. Yeah, so I think these are all really interesting associations. Um, and sometimes when we study metaphysics, we do study that, but actually metaphysics is something that is fundamentally just about the ultimate nature of reality. And so sometimes that is about other worlds, that is about this idea of perhaps a god or gods, or perhaps a realm that's different to kind of the natural physical realm we live in. Um, and sometimes th those are metaphysical answers, but sometimes the answers about the ultimate nature of reality are, are not about those things. So there's lots of different um, methods by which we can ask metaphysical questions. But I think somebody said it's about the big abstract ideas, and that's exactly right. Metaphysics is the broadest discipline. And you'll also take that in your first year because it gives you a vocabulary to talk about big questions really well. Okay, how about this next one, epistemology? What comes to mind when you hear that? Knowledge again? Somebody says the cogito, what is knowledge? Yeah, it sounds like you have a better sense of this, everyone. This is exactly right. So epistemology, if you don't know, is about asking that question, what can I know? What am I capable of knowing? How do I understand the world around me? And that's actually something I'm a specialist of. Um, is epistemology and asking, how do I understand the world? What can I actually know about the world? Um, and then I won't go on the last ones, uh, hermeneutics and ontology, but those are the other branches of philosophy. And we deal with those in the, the second year. We also think at SOAS about questions about decolonization, race, gender, disability, sexuality, and how all of these relate to the history of philosophy. Um, so, that's a really quick overview of kind of some of the themes you might study. What I'd like to do then um, is I just want to show you, oh, sorry, I'm having trouble switching screens. Here we go. 
um, if you, I wanted to introduce you to the teaching team. So on the left hand side is me. You can see that I've swapped my long hair on the top to my long beard in the bottom and short hair. Um, the joys of lockdown. And these are the people you would be working with here. So I'm, I'm the first year academic advisor. Um, and then um, my colleague Elvis Amaphidon, Dr. Amaphidon, is the second year advisor. And then there's Sean Hawthorne. And they are the core teaching team that would be kind of guiding you through three years at, at SOAS. And they'll be the, the core people that essentially you would reflect on these questions about what world philosophies is together. Um, I'm not gonna bore you with um, too much information about the program, but I'm quite curious to hear from you about questions you have when you hear the term world philosophies. So, um, We've talked about what wisdom is, we've talked about what philosophy is, but there's this other term about the world. I've given you a few ideas, but I'm quite curious. What do you think when you think of not just philosophy, but world philosophies? What does that mean to you? Any, any comments in the chat? Political economics. Is this deeper sense is a really interesting one. Why can I ask Clara, can you say why do you why do you mean deeper sense? What does the word deeper mean to you? Um, oh yeah, go ahead. Um I was just gonna say like understanding um basically like the questions and ideas behind cultures and um different cultures and how they relate to each other okay so a deeper sense is is maybe not just what we normally think about it but how maybe different cultures think about these questions is that right yeah okay great yeah and that's exactly that's exactly the kind of thing we think we we learn it so as is we learn to understand different cultures and how they ask those big questions like I outlined what is reality what can we know and so we try to understand how different people from different cultures might ask those questions and why that's important good thank you Clara um anyone else um I, I've just a few comments here philosophy beyond just the western philosophy you says so Asian African and Arab philosophy thought and yeah that's exactly right so the great thing about um the question of world philosophy is it includes multiple different um, philosophical traditions. And so I just want to show you, if you look here, on the bottom right there, it says traditions of philosophy. You can choose from your second year on all these different um, type traditions. So we could look at African philosophy and my uh, colleague, Dr. Maphedon, um is um, an expert in African philosophy. It's that he's actually, um, He's actually from Nigeria and is really involved in the African philosophical tradition. You could also do ancient and medieval Indian philosophy, Buddhist philosophy, Japanese philosophy, Taoism, Islam, religion, rationality, Islamic philosophy, Jewish identity and philosophy. So you can see a whole list of things beyond Western philosophy. And we'll look at not just these in dialogue with the West, but these in dialogue with each other. So for example, we might ask questions about how does Japanese Buddhist thought, for example, relate to aspects in Islamic philosophy? So we're not just thinking about things in dialogue between, say, Aristotle and Confucius, but perhaps thinking about things between, say, Islamic philosophy and Japanese philosophy. So, yeah. Um, and then the last comment, I'm just reading here in the chat, people said about world philosophies is knowing the human as a whole and the different way of seeing the world in function of our own culture. That's really interesting. What do you mean by the word function, Kenny? Like we're born in a culture that shapes. Yeah. And it's really interesting because um, 
That's, that's okay. <laughs> I think, um, so I teach in the first year a class called World Philosophies in Context. And actually the thing, the main thing that we study is the function of philosophy in different cultures. So philosophy might have a slightly different function in different cultures. So sometimes philosophy might be more related to um, a religious tradition of a particular culture. Sometimes it might be more related to kind of academia and a field of study. Um, sometimes it might be more related to kind of a scientific inquiry. But philosophy has a different purpose in different cultures. And so you kind of get to learn not just about the ideas, but also the way it relates to everyday life in those cultures. And so that's, that's a bit about what function means. What I want to highlight, um, thank you all for your really excellent replies. What I want to highlight is the way that I'm teaching now, asking you questions and then asking you to expand on it is exactly the way we teach philosophy. So philosophy is all about, like I said at the beginning, asking questions. And then it's about asking another question and thinking more about your answer. So this style is a little bit of a taster of the style actually of how classes go. It asks you to kind of get involved and ask questions and, and then um, the, the lecturers like myself or Elvis or Sean, we will ask you questions and we'll ask you to then explain your answer even deeper. But what it does is it gives you really excellent skills to be able to think about something, um, as someone else said, more deeply, not just simply on the surface, but more deeply. And so let me close with a final story before I open up to questions. And then I want to we'll do two things. I'm going to close the final story and highlight some of the skills philosophy might give you in this method of asking questions, then I want to spend plenty of time with you being able to ask questions. Um, so here's the final story. So there is this, there's this word um, that is um, in ancient Greek called orthodoxa. All it means is um, we might know the word orthodox in English, but the word is a slightly different meaning in ancient Greek. And it actually means common opinion or popular opinion. It just means the everyday understanding of the word. So like when I asked you, I said, what does wisdom mean to you? And you threw out a few answers, knowledge, contemplation, etc. cetera. Um, that's exactly what orthodox meant in ancient Greece. It's just that common initial understanding. And the story is, is that um, uh, Aristotle, the, the philosopher who I said became the most important philosopher in the Islamic golden age, Aristotle said, we have to start with what's common, but then we move on to this place called paradoxa, which is what the English word paradox comes from. And in paradox, you suddenly feel confused because you thought you understood what something meant, but then you suddenly are confused because you don't, you don't know what it meant. So for example, it's kind of like when you're looking and you think, um, you think you see your friend on the street and then suddenly you run up and you're like, oh, that's not them. Um, and it's somebody else, but they had the same haircut. Um, so you're slightly confused. And there's, there's that moment of paradox where you're suddenly disoriented. But Aristotle says that's where truth comes is in the moment of paradox. So you take something you thought you knew like wisdom you ask a lot of questions about it and you get to a paradoxical moment where you don't know exactly um, where what you thought you knew is different. But then suddenly you have a moment of, aha, now I understand that first word in a much deeper way. And so that's why we use the method of question asking. And here's what that will help you do. So um, the question asking helps you a lot with, I've just put up these graduate, graduate destinations here. A lot of our students go on to work in NGOs, um, in development work, in teaching, in government research, in journalism, in publishing, consultancy. All these fields really need people who know how to ask good questions and also who know how to communicate well. And that's what philosophy teaches you. So it teaches you how to really think about, it. you think you know something, but not just have the, the simple everyday understanding of it, be able to explain it in a much deeper way through the process of asking questions. And you'll be able to do that, not just through the perspective of a Western philosophy, but in dialogue with several different traditions around the world. So it will give you a really great skill set in question asking, but also in question asking of 
asking questions about other cultures and their identities and their beliefs. And so it helps you not just ask questions, but also have a dialogue with other people's questions. And that's really the, I think the, the best thing um, about why world philosophies, because it does teach you to ask questions, but it also teaches you to have a dialogue with others about the questions they might ask and to understand more deeply why those questions matter to them. So um, I want to open it up now to, to your questions, whether um, what it, so over to you and maybe if um, our student ambassadors would like to help jump in, ask some questions that they might've had uh, before studying philosophy or questions. Um, yes, yeah, so let's start with that. What questions might you have had, Sean, when you, before you began studying philosophy? Um, sorry. I can hear you. Oh, um, I'm not sure if I can hear you, Sean. Are you able to speak? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. So, did you, so um, what was the question again? Sorry. I just, I just um, wanted to begin asking questions by wondering what questions you might have had when you uh, began studying philosophy. So if you think back to kind of your first year, what questions did you walk in with? I think with the context of studying it, in um, in college at the age of four, and, and then come to start where it's a wide like wider range. I was came in with the questions of is Western philosophy similar to the like, African philosophy or Chinese philosophy? Is there similarity? And if there is a similarity, why have I not been taught it before, or why have I not been taught these different traditions before in the in the um, in the college system? So that's what kind of question I have. Okay. Yeah, that's, yeah, thanks for that, Sean. So you might have been, it sounds like you were thinking, um, I was taught Western philosophy, so I'm curious about what these other traditions are like. Are they similar? Um, are they different? But also, why, why haven't I necessarily been taught about these other traditions? So those are some of the things that you walked into the degree with. Yeah. Good. Okay, thank you for that. Um, just to open it up to others, if you want to just type in we have a question, Andrew, in the yes. Q&A, actually, from Zara. Yep, go ahead. He's asking, what if you were studying world philosophies as a joint honours? So if you could just elaborate on that point. Sure. Um, what I might do, actually, before we open it up properly to more questions, is I can quickly run through um, some of the practical details, if that, if that would work, Jack, um, so that you know. Um, so I'm sorry, you want me to run them through how to um, put questions in? Sorry, was that? No, no, no. So I'm just, um, I'm just double checking. I'm going to go back actually and, and show the difference between joint or single honors. Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah, the screen would be helpful. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so what I want to do, we'll, we'll, we'll go back to broader questions in a second. Um, but I think what I'd like to do is, is highlight what the structure looks like for those of you who might be interested in that. So this is the structure if you're a single honor student. So if you're a single honor, and I'll come to Zara to your question in just a moment, I'll highlight both of them in comparison, okay? As a single honors, these are the courses you take in your first year. So you take world philosophies in context with me, reading and writing philosophy. Um, and then there's a few, and then you have a choice after that. You could choose philosophy of race and racism, you could choose metaphysics. So there's a few different choices in your first year. And that's um, 30 credits, but you can also take a language if you want alongside. So if you're really interested, for example, in learning Arabic, Japanese, there's so many different interesting languages at SOAS, and you could choose one of those languages. It's really useful to choose one of those languages in philosophy as well, because you're studying so many different uh, philosophical traditions. Um, then there is the second year, and uh, which is on the screen there. And the, the, those two courses are compulsory that I've mentioned, philosophies of language, which was with me, and then philosophies of interpretation and understanding, which is with Dr. Amaphidon. And then that box on the right, you have all those choices of credits. Um, and so that you, and those are the topics I mentioned earlier that you could choose from. And then finally, in your third year, it's the same thing. You have um, one main course you take with Dr. Sean Hawthorne, Margins of Philosophy. 
Um, and then you also do an independent study project. So you kind of pick your own topic. Um, and then you have, again, you have the same choice of options. So that's a single honors degree. Now, if you wanna do a joint honors, like Zara's asking about, um, it's essentially the same thing, um, but in half. So for example, it would be um, instead of the entire um, bulk bean philosophy, it would just split, split straight down the middle. And so that you could choose, um, you know, I am so sorry, everyone. I think this screen is, is the wrong screen for a joint honors. And so- um, I, Andrew? Yes. You mind if I help because I'm actually a joint honors student myself. Please, Sean, go ahead. That'd be fantastic. Yeah, so I just like, because, okay, so um, I just want to give like a brief layout of what my timetable kind of looks like throughout the year. So it's kind of, it is like a half a split in half. So like you do half of, for, for me, half of history, half of philosophy. So this year, I for the philosophy side, I'm doing the, I've done philosophy of language with Andrew. Um, I'm also doing um, Dr. Mathedon's interpretation understanding as well. And then I've, and then the other half is my history side. So for history, I've been cities in history, women in Chinese history, um, culture and society in African history, and I did history approach and method. So it's a kind of 50-50 split because, and then yeah, it's in accordance to the credits as well. So you have to kind of like look at the credits and then look at the combinations you can do as well. Yeah, so thanks. I hope that helps. Yeah, no, definitely, Sean. And are you, can I just ask, so that, does that answer your question, Zara? While we wait to hear back from Zara on that one, should we move on to one of the other ones? We've had um, two questions about how the course is examined, yep. whether it's exams or just coursework or a mixture. Sure. Um, it's totally a mixture. Um, so I think, however, I would say that philosophy tends towards um, essays more than exams, um, because we really care about you learning the skill of writing. Um, and so, um, the a lot of the courses you'll be examined through um, writing an essay and submitting it by a deadline as opposed to sitting in an exam. Um, have you found that to be the case, Sean, that your classes tend towards essay writing more than exams? Yeah, actually, I found because looking through my modules, I've seen that I don't really have exams at all. It's mostly just essays and journals the major majority of the time. I only have like one exam. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, good. Thanks. Thanks, Sean. Thank you, I would man. say one thing for those of you who might be nervous about writing. First of all, take a deep breath. That's okay. Um, but also we do teach you a reading and writing philosophy course, which is specifically designed to give you the skills you need to write at university. And so it will really help you be a better writer and not write about philosophy. Um, Jack, what's the next question? So Zoya asks, what does the unit Islam, religion and rationality involve? What do you explore in this? So you know what, that's a really good question. And if I'm completely honest, um, that is not a course I'm particularly familiar with. And so I don't want to make up an answer and tell you, but I can tell you who teaches it, um, which is, um, my mind is just drawn a, a blank. I'm so sorry. Um, do you know what, I, I'm not in the best position to answer that. However, what I can tell you is that one thing I do know probably more broadly is it probably involves questions about the relationship between philosophy and religion. Um, and so how those two might go together because philosophy, like we said, is about asking questions and religion is about belief. So it might have to do with the relationship between the things we believe versus the questions we might ask. That's a very broad answer, but I don't know more specific than that. I apologize. Great, thank you. Um, is it possible to combine the course with a year abroad? Short answer is yes, hopefully when, when we're able to travel again. <laughs> um, but there is an application process. It's not just simply you tick a box and do it. You have to kind of make a case. Um, um, and, and I think the main thing that they're looking for there is mainly looking to, to see that you're interested um, in studying philosophy within a different cultural context and not just having your broad fun. Um, but yes, you're totally able to do that. Great, thank you. 
Yeah. Uh, Asya um, asks, is there maths in the logic module? And if so, is it particularly difficult? So it's interesting. I, I, um, I teach the logic one as well. I have the book here. I can show you. The short answer is no, but I can show you some of the questions. I don't know if you can see that on the screen. That looks a bit like maths. Um, it's not math. It's called symbolic logic. But um, at SOAS, so symbolic logic is a very short part of the overall course because we think it's important for students to know what that is. And it's a bit like maths, but we also ask about what are the limits of logic and what types of logic have other cultures employed in their own philosophical systems. So it's not just the maths kind of logic. There's about a week on that is all. Um, and it, so it won't be the main thing that would determine whether you pass the course or not. If that's not your week, it's fine as other weeks. Yeah, I just want to add to that. So yeah, yeah, you do learn the symbols, but like you kind of, and then, because I studied the logic last year, because we mostly focus on um, the UFIFO text, if any of you uh, are familiar with that. But, so it's mostly what the assessment was mostly actually on the UFIFO, and then the logic, and then the logic, then the symbols for the logic was kind of additional to that, if you know what I mean. So don't stress, it won't be the main thing for, for any essay. So don't stress about that. Good. Great, thanks both. We have about 12 minutes left, everyone. So do get your questions in. Um, we've got about three or four in the chats to, to address, but please do submit if you have anything to ask. Um, Amy Herbert asks, I've only had the opportunity to study Western philosophy at A-level. Which non-Western philosophical movements do you consider to be the most thought-provoking thought or pivotal? To be completely honest, I, I, I don't think you can, I think each philosophical movement has their own logic. Um, and by that, I mean the, their own reason why it's interesting or pivotal. Um, in my own interest, I am really, really interested in what's called the Kyoto School. Um, and I can, I don't know if I'm able to type in the chat here, but I can type um, name of a book if you're interested. It's called Inquiry into the Good by Kitaro Nishida. Um, that's one of my favorite books. Um, and it's, it's, it's by a movement called the Kyoto School which is in Japan, it's named after the Japanese city that it was founded in. Um, and we certainly studied quite a lot of the Kyoto School here at SOAS, um, and certainly in my courses. So that's just one suggestion. Um, but I don't think it, it's really that there's ones that are more important than the other. Um, they each have their own importance in their own culture, really. So yeah. Right. Do uh, Jasper asks, do you not have a choice of as many traditions stroke roots? I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you rephrase that maybe? I think he's basically asking us like how many, you know, do, do you get to go in a, a multitude of different ways or do you have to specialize? Ah, I see. Okay. No, um, it's really, you, you have the option to do both. So the first year is a lot more prescripted as you'll see in the, on the screen here. Um, the first year we teach you kind of the basics that will be useful for the rest, but in your second and third year, it's fine, Jasper, don't worry. Um, in your second or third year, you can do either. You can either take lots of classes about Islamic philosophy, that's really interesting to you, or you can do a bit of African philosophy, a bit of Japanese philosophy, a bit of Islamic philosophy, a bit of Western philosophy. So you really have the option to go either direction. Um, yeah. And uh, Tawanda asks, will we be learning much history in the course? Yes, is the short answer, because what we found at SOAS is that it's really important because we're not just looking at one tradition of philosophy, we're looking at multiple. It's quite important to understand the history surrounding each of those traditions. It helps us put them in context. So um, it's not necessarily loads of history, but there is, um, we take what's called an intellectual historical approach. So meaning that you look at the intellect or the ideas of a culture alongside their arguments. So it's not just about argumentation, but about the history surrounding it. Would you agree with that, Sean? Yeah, I was just gonna say like, during my courses, you find that a lot of historical circumstances kind of like, has a, um, an impact on like philosophical work. So like, some of the um, events you might briefly talk about like colonialism, the Enlightenment period, um, maybe even the world wars briefly. So like, yeah. Mm. 
Thanks for that, Sean. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Uh, Clara has asked, what kind of careers have past graduates gone on to do or study? Yeah, so I put up a, um, a slide a moment ago. I'll just put that up again, because I know I buzzed through it. Um, this is a list of the things. Um, I think there's kind of a few things that link all these together. One is that they are things that we would consider to kind of be, um, to make a difference really in the world. And the second is they're quite clever degrees or quite clever jobs. And by clever, I don't mean that everybody's a genius, but that they require you to not just, um, for example, make a cup of coffee, but rather um, have to use critical reasoning, which is what philosophy teaches you. So a lot of our graduates do stuff with NGOs um, or charities. A lot of them do stuff with uh, journalism and teaching and perhaps diplomacy and, and international law. So things that really make a difference in the world and require you to make a difference by using your brain to ask questions. I hope that's a clear enough answer, but that's a list of some of the main things people go into. We've had a question about um, possibility of work placements. Mm. So, you know, the great thing, uh, the, way, the best way I can answer that is so as has a, I'm just finding the right slide here, so bear with me a moment. Um, so as has a really great career service. It's the final point on the screen there at the bottom. The career service can um, help you with that. I don't know if Jack or Sean, you wanna talk more about that, but they do help uh, students find work placements. It's not something the philosophy department specifically does, but rather the university itself helps you do. Do you, either of you want to expand on that? I just wanna add that like, um, there there are, have, so if any of you are familiar with job sites like Indeed or Read, Source kind of has their own kind of site where they actually advertise the opportunities and jobs. And then I've, I've got, practically every day I actually get an email of any opportunities and, then that, and work that can be done either during school or after school or and that you experience as well. So, you have there's a constant. Um, so when it comes to work, what I'm trying to say. So there's kind of, there's many opportunities when it comes to work. That's all I'm trying to say. So yeah. And just to add to what Sean said um, is that it's actually something that is. Um, I used to work in a career center before I was a university lecturer and when em employers really like philosophy um, students because they, it, I think it just sounds clever to them or they think, oh, you know, they're probably learning how to be quite conscientious, reflective people. And so it looks really well when you try to get a work placement. Philosophy students do quite well typically getting work placements. Yeah. Just to add on to that, what I'm doing actually right now is actually a perfect um, job for you at university because not, um, it gives you a lot of, not only that do you earn a wage, but it actually gives you um, a lot of skills to add to your CV and get references for future jobs. So yeah, I actually recommend being a student ambassador in university. Um, we've been asked a question about the uh, teaching and learning. So are, are students taught through lectures and seminars and are the slides shared with students? Yeah, so um, I think the best way to answer that, let me give you a really quick snapshot on what each leak week each week looks like um so at the moment obviously things are a bit different but there's a site called moodle which is um, an online uh, learning platform where everyone will um, have access to if you're a part of a course and on there there is the syllabus so it's what we cover each week and every week before i start the course a few days in advance i upload my powerpoint or the slides so that the slides would be up there in advance you could look over them then there is a lecture um, on those slides. So you could kind of look at the slides while the lecture is happening. And then there's a, a seminar um, about those, like about those where you can ask deeper questions and maybe read some of the texts that you're looking at for that week a bit closer. So usually a philosophy week looks like a PowerPoint slide that's shared in advance on this site called Moodle. And then there is a reading usually that you're asked to do. And there's a lecture about that and about the slides, and then an opportunity to kind of ask more specific questions in the seminar about that reading. So that's kind of what it looks like week to week. Um, Andrew, are there any other books you'd recommend reading before starting the course? Do you know what? One of my favorite books actually recently, there, there's two things. Um, I'm gonna try to type this in the chat. Julian Bagini, 
um, has written a book called How the World Thinks. And it's really easy to read. And it's a great introduction to kind of not just Western philosophy, but um, uh, uh, different traditions of philosophy around the world. Um, the other book, that, or the other thing you might want to look at is, is a guy named Peter Admondson. He's at King's College. Um, and he does a thing, he does a podcast, which is quite interesting, called The History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps. Um, and he does a lot of I mean, in, interesting interviews with different people to learn about the history of philosophy from all over the world through all periods of time. It's one of the most comprehensive sources I can imagine, but the podcasts are really fun and easy to listen to. So those are two sources to check out. Do, um, do we require textbooks for each year? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, so the short answer is, um, the best way I can answer that is it, it does change year to year or, or class to class. But I think don't make that a cause for concern because all of the stuff that you need is provided for you online. Sean, do you have any comments on that? I was supposed to say that there's not necessarily a main textbook that like the classes really follow. There's mostly like various readings and extracts from various books. So yeah, that's what we have to say. So yeah. Yeah, so typically it's not a whole textbook, but usually it's a different reading each week. Um, that's kind of an article or a chapter from a book and that's posted online. So it's not like you have to go out and buy a textbook. Yeah, and it will be provided for you. So it, it just makes things easier. Yeah. Anything yeah, else? No, I don't think so. Um, and we're coming up to uh, 3, 3.50, which is when we were scheduled to, uh, to close the session. So if you just have a few final words, maybe, Andrew, and then we can, uh, we can sign out. Yeah, certainly. So um, I think, you know, I really hope that it was useful today. I'm just going to pop my email, uh, my SOAS email into the chat. Um, if you have any questions, please look back at the slide and um, get in touch with either myself or other members of staff. And we're super happy to chat with you and ask you any questions you might have. Um, I think, you know, I, I would just say that um, philosophy is probably the most important um, skill you can learn in life. So, um, be, be, and because uh, it's applicable to so many different fields, whether you become an academic or whether you go on to do another type of job, it, it's a skill that won't go amiss because it teaches you how to ask, ask good questions and doing it in a place like so as helps you ask questions in such a, a broad way that helps you understand how other people think. And I think that's really the value of it. So I hope it's been useful today. And um, please do drop us a line if you have any more questions. Thank you so much. Great. And thank you, Andrew, for uh, giving us a wonderful presentation. Appreciate it. And uh, for all of you for attending today. And have a great weekend, everyone. And uh, I'll sign out to the session now for everyone. So um, goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.